Well, uh, as you saw on the screen a minute ago, my name is Kenny Hancock, and to give you a little bit more of a background, I was the former children's minister here at Emmanuel Baptist Church for roughly 10 years uh, prior to going into the mission fields. Um, I currently serve with Proclaim Aviation in Minnesota, where I am, like she said, I'm a flight instructor and a missionary pilot who gets to do a lot of fun stuff. Um, I cannot thank you enough, this church. You guys have been such a blessing to me and my family. Uh, the financial support that you give is just a small portion, and that's not because you give a small amount. It is because what we value more than your finances that help us out is we value your prayers, and we absolutely value your communication with others and tell the story of what missionaries do. Now, I traveled all the way from the great state of Minnesota, very loose term, um, <laughs> And I came back down to warmer weather, and most of the people in the room right now, you know me. I actually thought about wearing my shorts today, but I did not want to do that to you guys. So um, I have never been, honestly, this pale in my life. Uh, about four days ago, I got an inch and a half of snow on my front doorstep. And the guy who's taking care of our home while we're away sent me a picture, and he said, I hope you're enjoying the weather. And I said, you can just send me my stuff. I'm not coming back. Um, <laughs> But uh, we do enjoy doing the work that we do. We do love, uh, I love training. I love training the pilots that I get to train, and there is an emphasis, a heavy emphasis on missionary work when I actually do get the opportunity to share the gospel with those who I fly with. Usually that turns out like this. We get about 5,000 feet in the air. I turn the engine off and go, do you know Jesus? <laughs> um, obviously, it hasn't worked yet. Um, so, no, but... Uh, I would love to sit up here and tell you, and I would love to stay and chat all about the mission opportunities that we do. I'd love to give you an update on Africa, and all of you guys who are dear friends of mine know that I cannot wait to share those things with you, but that's not the purpose of today. We are in the Advent season, and it is one of my favorite times of year, and I get the opportunity to speak to you in the continuation of the Advent series here at Emmanuel. Um, but before I go any further, I do want to say this. Um, if I say anything or I do anything to step on toes or I offend you in any way, shape, or form, you absolutely have the opportunity to email me and ask questions, and my email's on the board in just a second. So what I want you to do, uh, email often, email often, email late, um, he'll, uh, he'll get it to me eventually. So uh, in the Advent season, you guys have been through a series, and... Um, just so you are aware, um, this is my home. Florida is my home. This church is my home. I love everyone dearly who attend this church. And um, so we have our own church that we do attend in Minnesota. Uh, that's probably a good thing to know since I'm a missionary. But um, we also listen to the sermons here, the 930 that Kyle does and everything. And, and so I want to just give a little bit of a prop and a little bit of a shout out. Kyle was amazing the other day. Michael's sermon was spot on, and John Seth was awesome. And I love hearing the gospel being preached from my home church. I love the fact that the gospel is shared with a community that absolutely needs it. And I'm not just saying that because I've lived here for so long. I Everywhere needs the gospel. Everywhere we go needs the love of God. And everywhere we go needs Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And so you heard Michael talk about hope. You heard Kyle preach on peace and John Seth on joy, and I get the opportunity to teach you today about one of what I think is the culmination of all those things, love. So today's title of the sermon is Love Has a Name. And the thing is, is love is one of those things, like I said, that binds all those together. Because I do believe that the love of God that Scripture shows us is, you, well, let me I'll say it this way, you can't have the hope that Michael talked about. You cannot have the peace that Kyle spoke on, and you absolutely cannot have the joy that John Seth spoke on if you do not have the true love of God. Joy that comes from God is different than the joy that we experience in the world, okay? So I believe that love, what, you know, that what the God of love that we everybody talks about, the God of love and all those things that ties all those together. So if God does not love, there's no hope. And again, can you imagine a world 
without love? I mean, even in a world right now where we as Christians exist and do our best to exude, uh, exhume the love and just show love to the entire world, we are not getting too much of a sense of that these days, are we? I mean, we try to make an impact, and I honestly do not like watching TV anymore. It is heartbreaking to know that people like me exist, people like you exist, who know the love of God, yet we still see the downturn of society, and we still see the downturn of our world, and it is starting to get a little frightening to some of us. If you don't know where your hope lies, you don't know where your peace lies, is or your joy, most of us would be frightened to even walk out of our door some days. I live in an area now that is so close to things that are heartbreaking to see that some people are scared to leave their home. But in a world that doesn't show so much love right now, we do get a little glimpse of what the world sees love as. So before we get to talking about what biblical love is, let's talk about what love is not. It is not a Hallmark movie. <laughs> How many of you guys have seen some of those, sorry, things on, on, on TV right now? You know, the girl who's, you know, the hard-pressed lady who's got her career and falls in love with a lumberjack with a plaid shirt and smiley teeth. I've never seen a lumberjack that looks like that, and I know a couple. <laughs> love is not a feeling, Okay, love is not that feeling that we get that all inspiring. He's the love of my life. It is not what it's about. It is not this feeling that we get towards one another or towards things. And it is not controlled by those feelings. We hear the world tell us a lot, uh, follow your heart. Do what your heart tells you. Let me tell you what the Bible says about our heart. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? So we use the word love flippantly. We, 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 we say things, we say we love things flippantly. I have a really nice pen that I wrote this sermon with. I love that pen. It's a great pen. It makes a really good click. I love my car. My car is awesome, especially in Minnesota when the heat's on. I love my wife's toaster. It's amazing. (laughs) I I like to use a shark tank analogy kind of for this. If you were standing next to a shark tank full of hungry sharks, it is feeding time, and my favorite pin falls into that shark tank, am I going after that pin? That is absolutely not going to happen. And that's not love. So the world tells us and, and shows us things that aren't really true love. It's a feeling. Sometimes those feelings, just like in our scripture, can lead us to things that we don't want to be involved in. Sometimes it's relationships that go south really, really fast because it was based on that deceitful nature of our heart. So that's not, the like, that's not the type of love that I see in Scripture. In Scripture, I see a different type of love. A love that requires action. It used to be a DC talk song. Uh, if you guys don't know who that is, it's a super old band that I used to listen to. And they had a song called Love is a Verb. I am not going to sing it for you. <clears throat> I heard the all. No. <laughs> Trust me, you don't want that. Um, but I will say, I will say this. Um, there's, a, there's a quote that one of uh, pastors that I like to listen to says, and this is how he described it. Uh, a pastor by the name of Vodi Bauckham, he says this. Love is the act of the will and is first and foremost by choice. It is accompanied by emotion, which means it is not devoid of emotion, but not led by emotion which leads to an action on behalf of its object. Let me read that again. Love is the act of the will and first and foremost by choice. It is accompanied by emotion, which means it is not void of emotion, but is not led by emotion, which leads to an action on behalf 
of its object. Ladies and gentlemen, love has a name, and his name is Jesus. To understand biblical love, we need to look no further than the cross of Christ. The ultimate sacrifice that someone gave for all of us. And we see it in Scripture in John 15, 13. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no man than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. Jesus' own words. Right before he decided to give up his life on the cross. See, the thing is, is if, if most of us are know or are aware of the story, um, and I don't even like using the word story, we, uh, biblical things are fact. They happened, okay? And Jesus was in the garden praying with everything in him. I don't think any one of us has ever gotten the opportunity to pray this hard for something. We may try our best, but God's son prayed to the point where blood, he was sweating, if it's at all possible. If there's any other way to save humanity, please let it be another way. Ladies and gentlemen, the cross was a horrific scene. And he knew what he was facing. Yet the last part of his prayer, nevertheless, your will, not mine. I'm going to do it. I will do this. And he did it for you and me. We often like to dwell on God's love alone. Uh, we, you've heard people say, you know, uh, God is love. You know, it's usually on a pamphlet they give you at the airport. Here, you throw this away. Um, but we can't think of God's love without thinking of some of his other attributes that go along with that, okay? God has more than just love. To, to, to picture who God is, God is all things authority. He's righteous, a very righteous judge, and he will judge one day. Looking into that authority that God has, I don't honestly think we get the best picture uh, of who God actually is, I mean, we may say, we, you know, hey, I know, I know who God is. God is huge. God is big. We say things like this. Um, God is like blank. And then we, in our best human capacity, will try and fill in that blank with something. God is like the mountain. We say stuff like that because mountains are big. God is like the universe, because, again, we, we try and focus on these big, big things. Because we do get an idea and understand slightly of how big God is. But if we fill that blank in with anything, God is like blank. If we fill it with anything, we have just limited who God actually is. Our human brain cannot comprehend our creator to his fullest. Only one person in Scripture uh, was given his wish, and Moses asked God, I want to see you. And God said, okay, well, you can't because you die. But he said, I I'll show you my back. I mean, that's kind of weird, right? I'll show you my back. So he hides Moses in a crevice. He walks by the crack in the wall. So much to the point where it actually changed Moses' physical appearance. He, white hair, glowing. Uh, the people of Israel were scared to death when he came down from the mountain, thought he was a ghost because it physically changed him. We, we don't get an idea of how big God actually is, but we do kind of understand his authority just slightly. And, and the example I'm going to give you about authority, it goes something like this. Um, we all know... Uh, the authority of someone who is in control of things. Uh, the example I'm going to give you is this. Uh, how many of you guys, when you drive down the interstate, you go at least five miles over? Maybe 10? Yeah. No, we, we all kind of get that idea, right? Five, 10 miles over, that's not that big a deal. I'm not really breaking the law. I'm just sort of stretching it a little bit. Yet, 
Yet it doesn't matter if we got that cruise control set on five over or 10 over. As soon as the highway patrol officer pulls onto the ramp with us, we hit the brakes or we like, oh, instinctively our foot goes to the brake. That's your sin nature. <laughs> that is your sin nature going, I'm back. Oh, well, I actually wasn't going that fast. Said, well, okay. But the authority just entered the building. Okay. The authority just got on the highway. Oh, I used to say things to kids in kids ministry here, like, would you behave differently if Jesus was standing right here? Most of the time I said that because the answer would be absolutely yes. But that's the, that's the point, right? Well, here's the thing. God is here. <laughs> it should change our behavior. It should. So I'm, I, I'm not saying, and I don't, oh, hear, hear me say this. I'm not saying that it's wrong to try and describe who God is. So when we fill in that blank, it's not wrong of us. It's not sin to try and describe to others who our God is. I just think we severely underestimate it. I just think that on occasion, when we try and describe God to our, our friends or whoever it is we're witnessing to, I think that we just kind of gloss over the fact that God is not something we can really comprehend. Do the best to describe him as you will. Um, use multiple verbs, use multiple things as far as his actions, and use multiple nouns to tell him, to tell people that God is loving. God is the authority in my life. I follow what he says but uh, as I keep, as I continue to read scripture and I continue on this path of who's got authority is I have to look a little deeper and I have to see what the Bible actually says about us. What does scripture say about the human, his creation? And some of us may actually be a little discouraged if you read into what scripture says about us. It can be a bleak outcome if you don't know the truth or if you just read slightly and then stop. An example would be, so uh, as, as, as the human race, we are constantly turning our back on God. I mean, if you want evidence of that, look into the Exodus where Moses took the Israelites out. They had a physical representation of God every single day, pillar of smoke, pillar of fire, God providing for their needs physically every single day, yet they turned their back on him over and over and over and right on and on and on and on and on. We say prayers at our table now. God, thank you for this food. Thank you for giving us a healthy life. Thank you for providing for our needs. The Israelite people physically had that every single day and they still turned their back. Over and over and over. That gives you an idea of who we are. Then here's some more. Romans 7, 24. Paul calls himself wretched. Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Revelation 3, 16. We are vile Lukewarm, we will be vomited out. Sinners, the Bible calls us. Romans 8, 5, 323, 212. I can go on. Over and over and over again, we see this example of how we are not worthy of anything God gives to us, let alone his grace and his mercy. We are not worthy of his love, church. We should be at all times thankful and praising God simply because he has not dealt to us what we actually deserve. Another pastor that I actually enjoy listening to and uh, I believe is sound, Pastor Paul Washer said this one time, the more that I see what I really am in scripture and what I was, the more I see what I deserve and I still deserve the bigger God's love gets. If you recognize what you are and what we are as sinners, led by that deceiving heart on most occasions, and then you realize what God did for us, 
How big is that love, guys? How much more does he love us while we were yet sinners, while we were yet sinning? Christ died for us. Some of you have heard other people say, and I've heard this myself. So maybe you haven't, but I'm going to let you in on a secret. Some people have said, if God loves us so much, why would God send people to hell? If God loves us so much, if God is love, why would God send people to hell? I'm just going to clarify some of that statement and just give you a little bit of an answer, and this is the best way I can answer that. God is not sending you to hell. You're already on your way there. The human race is already on a path to hell. You're going. And unless Jesus is there and you accept our Lord and Savior, believe on him that he died on the cross, that's where you're going. God's not sending you anywhere. My job then turns from one of proclaiming the gospel to a rescue mission. How do I do that? By proclaiming the gospel. I, I use this example on occasion, and it's, it's, I don't know if it's the best one. I really don't, but it's one that I use. Um, if you have a friend who is, likes to drink, Maybe he likes to drink heavily. And believe it or not, I have friends like that. If you know that that person isn't in their right mind because of the alcohol, and they're about to leave wherever you're at, and they're getting in that car, and they are about to make probably the worst decision of their life that could cost them their life, how hard would you try to take those keys? How hard would you beg and plead, even going as far as to take the keys physically if you could? Because you know they're going to drive away, and there is a potential. In this scenario, it's just a potential that they're not going to make it home. What would you do? What if they got mad at you? What if they called you names? What if they said things that hurt your feelings, that heart that we love so much? The human race is on a pathway to hell. And your friends and your family that don't know Jesus, you want to show them love? Show them how to stop it. This is the same equivalent as you taking those keys as best as you can. You would fight for those keys. Why don't we fight for their heart? Why don't we fight for their soul? They're going to a place we know. In, our, in the, the, the drunk driving scenario, it is a potential danger. This is a real danger. They are on their way. And we have the answer to stop them. To turn that path. Because you know what? You're going to spend eternity somewhere. And that is a fact. Now, I'm up here supposed to be telling you about love. And I have no better example for love than stopping someone from doing the worst mistake of their life. You really love somebody? Share the gospel with them. Another example that we see in Scripture of God's love is him actually trying to get us to understand how we should treat each other. The simple act. Remember, love was an act, right? So what do we do? How do we act? Well, here's a couple of examples from Scripture that shows us how to act. Matthew 6, 26. He describes the birds of the air, neither reap nor gather in the barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable to God than the birds or even the flowers? So God's describing his love for us at that point. Matthew 22, there's a portion of Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 22 where uh, Jesus was approached by a lawyer, and the lawyer confronted him and said, what is the greatest commandment? And he said at the beginning, he said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all of your mind, with all of your strength. And second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus was quoting Deuteronomy 6 at this point. So 
love your neighbor. You know, if you guys know the story, the lawyer tried to get him back into a corner and, well, who's my neighbor then? That's all of us. It's not the guy across the street. It is as well. I should say that. We all are. Take care of each other. Love each other to the point where you are sacrificing things to take care of everyone. As best as it's on you, at least. These were not feelings that Jesus was talking about. These were actual acts, things to do. Take care of each other. Provide for each other's needs. We see that in the book of Acts, the church taking care of each other, giving up of their needs, selling things daily to provide for each other. Jesus sacrificed his life. And you, at this day and age, what we sacrifice is what? Time? Maybe? Counsel with a friend? Money on occasion? So I was uh, speaking toward that in the relationship aspect. I actually was uh, able to be a part of and also attend a wedding, two different weddings. My brother, uh, Clay, just got married last, not, this, not yesterday, but last Saturday. I was in that wedding. Uh, and yesterday I got to attend Emma Crisman's wedding, both beautiful weddings. Um, but what an example of God's love that is, marriage. It can be, and it should be. The joining of two lives into one life so that others may see the glory and the love of God. And I believe that's what marriage actually is. A Christ-centered marriage is one where both spouses give 100% sacrificing things for each other. And ultimately, if that's the case, and you are sacrificing one for another because you are that one flesh, the world sees God. The world sees God's glory because that Christ-centered marriage is a praise to the union that God joined together. Marriage is a beautiful example of what the love of God looks like and can look like. So you, you guys have heard it said, uh, I don't know if you guys are ever familiar with the love languages. You guys heard those, that statement before? You know, each spouse has their own sort of love language. My wife's love language is the act of service. Like my wife, like absolutely. I could buy her anything on the planet. It could cost thousands and thousands of dollars. And she's like, thank you. Would you please wash the dishes? <laughs> You know, we, uh, we all have the, you know, the proverbial laundry chair. I don't know if you guys have that. You know, that you grab the laundry out of the basket. I got it. <clears throat> and I feel proud. <laughs> and with my wife, it's, it's more of a, you know, could you do that without being asked next time? <laughs> and, you know, and for me, I mean, just personally, for me, I am the gift guy. I, I love of gifts, and, and it's not the gift itself, to be honest with you. For me, it is really the thought. Somebody could give me a 50-cent trinket from Chuck E. Cheese, something that they, you know, took them like 500 times on the ski ball to get 1,000 tickets, and I get a little plastic ring. But somebody at one point in life may know that that was a part of my childhood, and it was the thought. Remember back in the day when we used to go to Chuck E. Cheese and I got you this. It's a thought for me. Others of you have a different type of love language. It may be different for you, but know this. God's not going to give me a Chuck E. Cheese trinket. God gave me his son. And when I think of the sacrifice that God had to, the thought process, and again, I'm putting human emotion to a God that has no body, but I am putting a human emotion because that's the way I can try and describe it. Again, if you were to ask me, would I be comfortable sending my daughter away for the sole purpose of dying for anyone as a father that would be hard. It would be difficult. 
And as a missionary, I would love to stand up here and say, absolutely, yes, but I would be lying to you. My kids mean more to me than, quite frankly, almost anything on this planet. Yet God chose his son for one purpose and one purpose only, to pay for all of us, to ransom for the sin that we commit and will continue to commit because we are human beings, and he willingly sent his son to do something unthinkable, to pay a price we could never pay. That's love. I'm reminded at this time of year about the Israelites in darkness. I'm reminded of the darkness that the world was in before God sent his son and his only son to be the light to outshine all of the lights, to bring a hope to the world that was in silence, to bring peace to a people and a world in turmoil and unrest. To give joy to those whose smiles had faded and whose hearts had grown saddened by the hundreds of years of silence. And the love that God showed us by choosing to pay a price for our sins that we could not pay. I'll end with this. John 15, 13 again. Greater love has no man than someone that laid down his life for his friends. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this season of Advent for this season where you sent your son for all of us. God, may we never, ever forget in the praise that we sing today, throughout the week. May you be at the forefront of our thoughts. May you be the one who guides our thoughts, that guides our actions to show a dying and lost world the love that you so desperately want us to know. God, we love you. We praise you for all the sacrifice. We praise you for everything that your son did for us and what we stand for. May we accept him. In your name we pray. Amen.